joining us now is former BYU quarterback, great second-round draft pick in the NFL. We're calling him the BYU quarterback whisperer for what he's done with Zach Wilson and Jaron Hall. He is John Beck. Fun John, guy. welcome to the show on a Friday. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you guys? We're great, man. We're awesome. uh, we're trying to figure out if we think it's better for BYU football to be ranked going into the season or to be just outside the poll because we just cited that the four best finishes in the AP Top 25 for BYU in the history of the program all began with the Cougars being unranked. Like they've had these mighty rises, but it's just it's just nice to be validated and start a season ranked. So where do you stand on that? Like, is it more beneficial? or more of a motivator to not be ranked? What, what do you think? Maybe it does have something to do with a little bit of the chip on the shoulder effect where you start outside of that 25 and you're saying, we're way better than this, let's go prove something. But it would be nice to start the season a little bit higher, like you guys were talking with me during the break, like some of those teams, how much they could have gained from starting inside the top 25 and then putting those seasons together. Um, because you can only climb so high when you start outside the top 25. I think it'd be cool to break the trend, though. How about we have a, a top finish for a team and let them start inside the top 25, mm. and let's see how high they can go. And that'd be great, because the seasons we're talking about are zero or one loss years. Like, these are truly the most special seasons in BYU history, right? But take me back to 05, because um, you guys are a top 10 offense. You played some close games. You rebounded and went to a bowl game. You walk into 06 with high internal expectations, but people didn't think, hey, this BYU team is going to be one of the top 10 teams of all time and da, da, da. So obviously the one and two start, you had to climb out of it and win 10 in a row to finish 16th in the country. What do you, how do you feel about that 06 game relative to sort of expectations versus reality? Well, we, inside of that 06 team, we knew how good we could be. Uh, you know, you finish the season losing in a, a, a game to a good Cal team in a bowl game, an overtime game to Utah, and you kind of know. And then TCU that year was a, an overtime loss. So you're looking at it like, you know, we were two overtime losses away from being the conference champions and then close to having a bowl win. And it's like, okay, we're right there at the tipping point. And really, it didn't matter where we started. Like, we weren't looking at it like, oh, we should be inside the top 25. It was more like we know we're a really good team. The unfortunate thing was then you go start the season off one and two. Nobody at all would have thought that's how it was going to go. But that internal belief within the team of, all right, let's just get things going, let's get back on track, and we can run the table. Uh, I, th I think there were a lot of people going into that season that believed we could have an undefeated season. Um, I know that's how I felt. I know that's how a lot of my teammates felt. Um, it, didn't, it was an undefeated season, but it was pretty close. And I think that that's one of the biggest things as well is what's the nucleus of the team? Like, what do they feel about what that season can look like? And you look at the leaders, you look at the seniors, you look at the coaching staff that's been around a lot of NFL football. I mean, sorry, not NFL. Jeez, I've done so many. <laughs> I've done so many interviews. I'm like spinning out NFL and college. Like, holy crap. Uh, but, you know, I look at some of those coaches that are on staffs that have seen a lot of the really good teams, and they say, this team's got it. Um, and so whether you start inside, outside the 25, like at the end of the day, it's how does that team feel? Because that's what's going to make the season, whether it starts out rough, whether there's a rough patch in the middle that you got to overcome. What does that team believe about themselves? Uh, you're not kidding. That 2006 season was a double overtime loss at Boston College and a last yeah. second 49 yard field goal against Arizona away uh. from being undefeated. It's wild. But you, to your credit and the team's credit in 2006, you go on the road, you win your conference opener against 16th ranked TCU, and then you rattle off 10 straight wins to finish number 16. When you finally did crack into the rankings, John, how much did that matter to you as a player? It didn't. I mean, I wasn't one of those guys that was like looking at the rankings and seeing like, all right, hey, where are we now? Because I never really had that luxury in the seasons before that. We were struggling a lot of the time. So, you know, the ranking thing wasn't as important to me as just going out and performing each and every week. Um, and, you know, at the end of the season, it is nice to know, hey, we rattled off all these wins. We were viewed as a top team. In your mind, you actually feel like, well, we should be higher than that. Like, these teams that we lost to in the beginning of the season, there's no way we should have lost to them. But, I don't know, as you're going during a season, it, it like, for me, it never really mattered. I don't know what it would have been like to – I know there was a year there where, like, Max and Dennis and Austin and those guys at one time were, like, 
dang near the top five, I want to say. Or one time they were ranked like a six or something. I know they played a TCU game where I think both were close to being inside the top ten. I mean, maybe then it matters. But I just know when, like, when our team was going, we've been through so much my senior class. I don't know if many guys were focused on where they were ranked. We just wanted to win each game we played in. Yeah, 08 is it ranked as high as eighth in the AP poll, and then 09 as high as yeah, seventh, which is just incredible to crack the top ten like that. Okay, let's talk about Jaron Hall. He walks in healthy and the guy for the first time, right? Those two combination things. He's worked with you during the offseason. He flew, he didn't drive. What was it like <laughs> for Jaron uh, working with him? What did you work on, and what do you foresee this season? So before I answer, I just want to apologize to any BYU fans that this season I'm crossing my fingers that there's no stuff on ESPN where they talk about trips out to California. <laughs> no, I know BYU fans are so sick and tired of hearing that, and I'm just like, look, I'm crossing my fingers. Uh, Please. But <laughs> I'm super excited for Darren. Look, it's been a great opportunity for me to get to know him. Um, he's worked extremely hard, especially this last year. We've been able to spend the most time over kind of his time at BYU. The most time has been this year. I've been able to make some trips up to Provo. Oh, crap. That may get out now. Now we're going to talk about my trips up to Provo. <laughs> John Beck went to Provo. He drove 12 <laughs> hours to Provo. <laughs> I flew. I flew everyone. He took a hand um, cart to Provo. Okay. Okay. You came up to Provo <laughs> to work with him. Oh my gosh, is that going to be a thing like how they make the young men and women in the world go push hand carts? It's like <laughs> people are going to make the trek. Make the journey. Are BYU the fans Zach did. Going to... <laughs> oh what, are, what have we done? <laughs> oh my gosh, there's going to be like a Ragnar race from Huntington Beach <laughs> to Provo. The, the BYU quarterback Ragnar. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Bring it oh on back. Really? We're, we're, bring, we're bringing right. it back. We're bringing it back. Okay. So you, you flew, you flew up here. You worked with Jaron. What did you work on when you were with him in Utah? Well, for really, it's like, it's kind of fine tuning a lot of the things uh, that we introduced a few years back. Right. So the stuff that we teach, the way that we kind of integrate things into a person's system, into their offense, it takes time, right? It's not just like a flip of a switch. Like, I know everybody sees the Zach Wilson that went off and had that amazing junior year and was the number two pick. That was years in the making. So the cool thing for me is, um, just like how I've been with some of my NFL guys, you see these great strides year two, year three. This is Jaron's opportunity for those things. Um, he had a great year last year. He was super efficient. But there's some things that we absolutely identified on tape and said, all right, these are areas that we can build. And he's worked really hard at those areas. And I've seen the fruits of his labor when I get out to practice on the field with him. The other thing that's been cool, he's done a great job of bringing teammates out here and then having teammates there when I'm in Provo. So it's been awesome to work with the guys on the offense within that system. And to me, I expect to see a cleaner version of Jaron, which – to most people's eyes, they're not even going to notice it because it's little details like his drop, his positioning, his eyes, what he does with his shoulders. There's some things that he's going to be doing as a veteran player where he's going to be able to manipulate some people based off of some things that because of the experience of last year, he can now build upon it. Nobody can just jump. It's like the same anything in life, line upon line, precept upon precept, right? We want to grow. It takes time. It's the same in quarterbacking. So it's cool to have last year's experiences and then build on them. Now, John, I was talking with uh, Max Hall and some other former BYU quarterbacks about some areas of improvement that they've seen with Jaron Hall and specifically his vision in the middle of the field has come up. Do you feel like Jaron is overall seeing the field better, especially in the middle when it can get kind of uh, crowded and, and muddied up in there? Yeah, we've talked about that. I think there's a comfort level. I think it goes a variety of ways. I think some of it, it you know, traces back to how much of a person's offense have they played in, the systems that they've been in have truly attacked the inside between the hashes part of the field. Like, it's easy to watch on TV and be like, well, that guy should do this more. Okay, well, what has he done offensively before that? What type of instruction, what type of opportunities has he had in practice to go out and fail while trying to find ways to work those windows in the middle of the field. Some of the best things that happen in the college offseason is that you get time where coaches aren't on the field with you. So it's like this fail-safe environment where you can go out and say, my plan is to work 
my vision in this area of the field and to get better at it. And it doesn't matter if it works or not because you're out there trying to get better. So, you know, I think for Jaron, it's, it, it's a place where one, because of his stature, it's always going to be, and I hate to word, use the word a challenge, but there's just going to be aspects of it that aren't going to be as clean as like a 6566 six, six guy. And that doesn't change. Um, but there's things that you can learn. There's windows that you can start to pick up and there's ways to make it a part of your game, but it has to be something practiced. Nobody can just, because the middle has some windows, oh, well, now you can just find them because they're there. Remember, nobody has a bird's eye view when they're field level. Everything's down low. And when you're looking behind your offensive line, it literally takes a specific style of eyes, of movement, of those things for you to get good at working inside that area. So I, I would imagine it's an area that they want to attack because of the guys that they have. And with Jaron's time spent saying, okay, here's how I can do a better job, I should see, or we should see, you know, more balls taken in there. And I think there's some things also with him and the ability he has to actually cut it loose in those small windows is something that we've worked on of saying that that window may be as small and the vision you have may flash just in a quick period of time. How quickly can the ball get out and how accurately can we throw it? We're talking to John Beck, who's establishing the Zach Wilson handcart uh, path <laughs> down to Southern California <laughs> next summer. You can get your tickets now on John Beck, Zach Wilson dot com. Uh, John, let's talk about Zach Wilson. Second year, obviously the Jets employed you to work closely with him last year. What uh, do you see for his future this year as he tries to make the jump? I'm, I'm super excited for this guy. Um, I'm about as excited as I've ever been for a quarterback um, to just see that jump that he's going to be able to make. And, and, and here's why. Like, they did a great job of acquiring some guys around him and some guys that are good guys. I've been fortunate to be able to spend a lot of time around uh, that team and those teammates of his. And, uh, you know, there's, there, there's certain guys that when they're in the NFL, uh, they just have a way about them where you say, that guy, I like that guy. I like the way he works. And I like, I know he's going to bring something to this football team. And you can't say that about everybody. Um, but Zach has a lot of those guys around him. I think the biggest thing that he has going is, uh, he, he gets to be a part of the same same system, same staff, same philosophy, same teaching, same quarterback room. There's not a lot of change around him. I've said this for years because of some of the experiences I've went through. If you want co consistent quarterback play, and if you want consistent quarterback improvement, then create an environment of consistency around him. And the New York Jets have done that. And so I'm really excited to see what the season can look like. I've watched Zach become far more comfortable with the system because of all the experience that he's had, the style of communication that he's been able to use this offseason with his teammates has been awesome. And I just see, you know, an opportunity for a lot of growth. But the hard thing about the NFL is you have to take schedules, injuries. You have to take so many things into consideration. It's not just because you improved as a player. I've been around a lot of guys that have made improvements. That does not always mean you improve in the win-loss column. That doesn't always guarantee that because you had a great offseason, you get to have a healthy season or your teammates around you remain healthy. All of these other things, it's just you cross your fingers and you hope that the stars can kind of align and things, things work out. But if they do, and if the guys can stay healthy, I really think it's going to be an awesome, an awesome year for the Jets to see a lot of improvement out of their quarterback. John Beck, elite quarterback and football analyst. Great to have you with us on the show, man. We'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, man, that was good. We had some laughs there, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> it was a memorable one for sure. <laughs>